to be here. I actually have a short uh, presentation to the council. However, I wanted to say firstly that this is a uh, wonderful initiative uh, with the different players within the construction industry coming together to form this council. And I think it is very, very important for us to understand the reason as to why we need to do this because there needs to be a particular level of professionalism that needs to be brought into the uh, construction uh, industry itself. There are of course a number of loose ends within the construction industry and uh, given the fact that government has uh, very much embarked on outsourcing a lot of its work, government has embarked on ensuring that we bring a lot more professionalism the whole ambit of uh, modernity bringing, uh, being brought into the Fijian economy and overall into the, and overall into the country requires us to think outside the box, it requires us to also implement and engender a particular level of professionalism that hitherto has not been present in, in Fiji. I can give you many examples, so today, I, tomorrow I can go off and I uh, get a, a couple of spades together, get a couple of people together and I can form a construction company. Uh, that's the manner in which people can form construction companies and there is no, at this point in time, no legal requirement in terms of meeting various, uh, you know, standards, in terms of qualifications, in terms of experience, in terms of indeed liability also. Um, but what I, what I thought I'd do is just do a quick presentation and if, with your permission, uh, I think it would be also good if I, uh, if I could be allowed to answer some questions, if people wanted to ask some questions in respect of where we are. So if I could have the first slide, please. Um, I was essentially divided into, into three key areas. One is, of course, the construction sector itself, the ease of doing business policies and the 2019-2020 and budget policies, which has an impact uh, on the construction industry itself overall. The construction sector itself, uh, over the past three years, um, has grown at an average rate of about 9% per annum between 2016 and 2018. Uh, the sector registered a positive growth since 2013 and accounts for about 2.9% of GDP. The uh, total value of the work, of course, has grown uh, in an average of 10.9% from 2013 to 2017. Uh, generally, of course, the construction sector in Fiji has not been taken seriously over the past number of decades, in, in particular post-independence, but is not seen as a major contributor uh, to economic activity. Uh, nor has there been the sort of the nexus drawn between the construction industry and employment creation in terms of uh, training, in terms of skill sets. All of that has not been actually linked uh, very well. Uh, we've of course seen uh, uh, an uh, increase in credit by the private sector of the past few years. Obviously, generally, when the private sector borrows, they tend to borrow, of course, for capital construction. And that we've seen an increase of, which means there's been a lot more activity as far as construction is concerned. Interestingly enough, of course, if you look at the comparison between the employment rates and the numbers, uh, in 2011, for example, there's something like 6,000 people in, employed in the construction sector. Uh, today we have, in, 20, in 2016 actually, we had 24,300 people employed. Uh, that's, uh, can you just go back to that please? Uh, that, that's an increase of about four times within a short period of time, which of course has meant you've got a lot of foreign workers coming in too. Uh, there's also been departure of uh, good tradespeople from Fiji to you know, places like Christchurch, Australia, New Zealand, well, there is a shortage of people. I just uh, returned from Sydney yesterday and, uh, you know, just sitting on the train, I caught a lot of trains while I was in Sydney and I heard all these Kiwi accents and all these different accents. Uh, Kiwis moving from New Zealand to Australia in the construction industry, Fijians moving from Fiji to New Zealand, Fijians moving uh, into, uh, into uh, Australia also. I met a young man a um, man by the name of Sai from Kandavu on the, at the train station in Lidcom and uh, he's been studying at FNU, he's decided to move to Australia now and he's doing a course on um, business management in construction industry whilst working on the job site. Um, so that's the kind of skill sets and the kind of you know uh, professionalism we do require and I've spent nearly 20 minutes trying to convince him to come back to Fiji. Uh, because we need uh, these young, able-bodied people with the right skill sets, with the right management skill sets to be in Fiji because 
Uh, otherwise, there will be a dearth of good professionals within the construction sector in Fiji. And I'm sure many of you are actually feeling that, uh, that, that, that gap. Um, if I go to the next one, please. Um, now, I, I put here just a very short bullet point in respect of uh, the cost of construction. As you know, government has been very keen in respect of, um, uh, of getting a lot of construction, in particular in public rental housing space, in respect of uh, building up the stockpile of homes, because the rate of home ownership in Fiji is very low. The rate of insurance overall in Fiji is very low. Only about 10% of the properties in Fiji are actually insured. And now, we then had uh, a few years ago, about two, three years ago, we had commissioned a study by the World Bank uh, where we had a team of people who came to Fiji and did an assessment in respect of, for example, the, the quality of construction in terms of the construction costs. And they found on average, uh, to take an example in public rental housing, where you have what we call the public rental housing flats, and uh, they found that on average one bedroom flat cost about $80,000. Um, in respect of you know having all the amenities fitted in, that is very very high. They said it's extremely high compared to what the construction costs are in many other uh, countries like uh, you know uh, Indonesia's, your Malaysia's. Uh, you know even taking out the factor of volume, they found that the cost was still too high. And one of the findings was that the methodology of construction in Fiji was still very rudimentary that our ability, the construction industry in Fiji had not adopted new technologies, new methodologies of construction. And so we are fairly rudimentary uh, in, in the way that we approach uh, construction in Fiji. So that has obviously, be, it is a problem. And I hope that the council can, you know, engender again the adoption of new technology. You need some investment in research, you need some investment in development and also being able to use new, um, uh, you know, equipment and new uh, materials to adopt, uh, uh, you know, these new methodologies. Qualified personnel, as I mentioned, of course, there's a, there's a dearth of that, you know, not just in terms of uh, having good tradespeople on the job site, uh, but also in respect of the, the professional skill sets, so whether it's engineers, whether it's uh, uh, quantity surveyors, whether it's service engineers, there is a whole a shortage of people in that respect. As you know, that government's uh, um, topper scholarships, for example, that we do give about 75 to 80 percent of all the scholarships are skewed towards, you know, the non-traditional areas. So, for example, we don't give a topper for somebody to become a lawyer. They can get tells. Um, we have more focus on engineering, uh, doctors, teachers, uh, marine scientists, foresters, environmental people, etc because we see there's a huge shortage of people in, in terms of land surveyors, uh, town planners, a huge gap in the skill sets. And in fact, many of the courses in Fiji, they are not available in Fiji at all. So we need to ensure that we have at the very basic level in terms of training, in terms of universities, we have those courses available, we have the particular experienced people to be able to teach our young people those courses. Again, there's been some complaints about that and we've uh, spoken to FNU. The people who run these various schools need to have the right prerequisite skill sets and indeed the qualifications to be able to actually teach our people. Um, that's very, very critical to ensure that we have those uh, synergies in place. Um, of course, uh, collaboration between construction uh, professionals is very, very important. Um, uh, two, three years ago, through the Ministry of Industry and Trade, uh, we decided to fund professional organizations to, you know, uh, bring up the level of uh, uh, professionalism, if you like, level of uh, collaboration. We actually have funds available for the Construction uh, Industry Council, uh, but they need to make sure that the, your constitution is right, you fulfill your audit uh, requirements, and then we will give you money. Uh, we need the architects. We've got money for the Architects Association. We've got money for the Engineers Association. Uh, but there seems to be very slow uptake. I don't know why. Maybe you don't want to show us your accounts. I'm not sure. But, but you need to do that. You seriously do need to do that. And I think not, there's not a much uptake on that. So please change your mindset. Please uh, you know, understand that we want to fund you. We want your councils to be funded. We want you to help us lift up, lift up the level of professionalism in Fiji. You know, the earlier example that I used that tomorrow I can start up a construction uh, company, 
We should not have been in that position. We should have licensed construction companies where there is a, some sort of fallback system in respect of you know, professional indemnity costs in terms of the quality. Um, and because we do also want to bring, uh, you know, build up a cadre of local construction companies. If you look at, you know, some people have argued, if you look at some of the major hotels that are being built in Fiji or that have been, been built, built uh, they are construction companies from overseas. Why can't locals do that? Why can't locals partner with them, collaborate with them? They'll only do so if you have a particular level of licensing, a particular form of regulation that is transparent, a particular council that is transparent, uh, and that will actually you know, attract people uh, to Fiji. They'll want to collaborate with them. And I think this is very, very important to do that. Uh, again, I talked about putting terms and conditions of uh, employment. Um, you know, I had uh, about two years ago, a couple of uh, owners of construction companies come to me and say, can you pass a new law to stop workers from leaving one job site and going to the other? And I said, what's the problem? I said, well, you know, I'm paying about seven fifty an hour for this uh, guy to lay the bricks, and, uh, but uh, he's just left. Uh, he's gone to the other job site because somebody else has offered him eight fifty an hour. Uh, that is a reality. There is a shortage of people in various uh, areas. Um, but also you need to ensure that your terms and conditions of employment of your people who work within the industry, in particular tradespeople, or those with very little uh, you know, uh, trade experience but maybe digging, you know, digging trenches for foundations, etc., or laying various you know, uh, steel, etc., you need to remunerate them well. You need to, be, you need to have a particular level of transparency. In fact, uh, one of the major areas of criticism of a lack of uh, safeguards for employees is, in the, is from the construction sector. Uh, this is why we announced in the budget that we are currently working on a particular um, uh, program initiative where all people who work on the construction sites must be paid electronically. And we're going to implement that very soon. There are many job sites where the construction workers are actually paid in cash on the site in brown paper envelopes. I've seen it myself. Object CWM, there's a construction site there. People paid on the street. They queue up on the street and they're being paid on the street. No record, no pay slip, no overtime, no wet allowance, no meal allowance, all of these things. I, in fact, I had a group of young men from Tailevu who came to see me about 18 months ago. Uh, saying, look, you know, we've been exploited. Uh, they pay us, they said, well, if you don't like it, you can leave. Uh, so the FNPF is not paid. Now, all of you do recognize that there is a shortage of uh, good people, good tradespeople. You need to retain people. You don't want to lose them to Australia and New Zealand or lose them to other companies. Then you need to be able to ensure that you look after the workers. There needs to be a particular level of transparency in the manner in which you look after your employees. So we will implement that. Uh, we are working through various mecha, you know, mechanisms as to how we'll do that. We are going to have conversations with the banks too in respect of certain accounts not necessarily attracting the same level of service fees. Um, the M-Pesa wallet is actually a good methodology of uh, paying people electronically, then we'll have records of that. But that's something, again, you need to, uh, you'll see some changes in respect of that. And we look forward also to your contributions. Uh, foreign workers, as we've said, um, you know, I went to a British American Tobacco uh, groundbreaking ceremony. They're putting up a facility in Nandi in Votolevu a few months ago, a local construction company. Everybody on site were Bangladeshis. Every single person worker on site were Bangladeshis. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, but then I've also had complaints directly, not from that particular job site, but from other foreign workers where they've been, you know, um, promised seven, eight dollars an hour, which is what they pay locals here, but as soon as they get here, they're paying them three fifty an hour, three twenty an hour. I've been to job sites where people are, you know, chipping off tiles off the walls, a lot of dust, but they're not wearing any protective gear. Uh, and these are foreign workers. They're not being paid overtime. They're not being paid meat allowances. Now, how will you continue to attract people if you don't look after, look after those fundamental aspects of uh, personnel management? We don't want to be a repository of a country or have a reputation 
that, oh, if you go to Fiji, you'll get exploited. You would have seen a couple of days ago in the papers, I think it was yesterday's papers, uh, some people have promised visas, etc., and they paid $15,000 to come to Fiji to get a work visa. So you have to, uh, you know, ensure that you look after the workers, whether they're foreign or, or domestic workers. Uh, as announced also in the budget, uh, we, some of you who have, would have brought in workers from overseas, we're removing the, the bond, you know, you have to pay a bond to the immigration department where you have to pay, you know, uh, put in uh, trust the, uh, the airline costs associated with the return air, air travel, that will be removed but we're going to follow the Singapore uh, uh, method, which is you'll pay a small fee, apart from the work visa application, uh, and that fee will actually go towards training of Fijians in, in various aspects. So whether it's TVET, uh, whether it's through various courses at FNU, uh, a lot of um, Fijians also need to be retrained, and uh, that, that funding will actually go towards that to ensure that when we do bring in foreign workers, whether it's a CEO of a bank, uh, whether it's a, somebody bringing to lay, lay tiles, whoever it is, there will be a small fee paid and that funding will actually go towards training of Fijians. Uh, building standards, again, that's something that we need to ensure. You know, I've had so many people say to me a number of times, they said, you know, the, the finishing in Fiji is not very good. But whenever you bring somebody from overseas, the finishing is really good. The tiles that were laid at uh, Nandi Airport with the re uh, refurbishment that took place, the 125 odd million dollar refurbishment, the tile layers actually came from Samoa. Uh, I think uh, there are some people in this room who may know about them, and these people did good work in New Zealand. Uh, I see PBS guys here, I think they were involved in that. Um, the, the reality of the matter is that uh, Fijians can do it. Um, are we actually recognizing them for their skill sets or are they going off to Christchurch to do the right finishings? But we need to ensure that the quality and the standard of buildings in Fiji needs to improve. I mean, similarly with, with architecture. I mean, I know certain architects in Fiji, I can look at a building and say it was done by that architect. The signature trademark, some people have put a lot of pillars, a lot of poles, uh, but you know, whether are we being, are we being creative in the architecture that we are, we are putting out? Is there new styles, new attractions? How are we doing in respect of being more greener in respect of the, the designs that we're implementing? Are we allowing for more light to come in, more natural light? Um, I, I was at a hospital in Liverpool Hospital two days ago and then of course there's some cost factors involved too but you know the entire wall was all, all glass and it was very very comforting going to a hospital uh, where you get a lot of natural light. Uh, are we using, you know, are we doing, for example, things like water storage uh, in, into our design plans? Those are the things that we need to move ahead and uh, look forward to and indeed be attractive uh, on that basis. As you know, that we made a number of announcements in respect of the um, uh, Digital Fiji program. Uh, we are working very closely with the Singaporeans. We're investing over $30 million, um, at least in this financial year, in, in respect of um, the Digital Fiji uh, program. There's a number of initiatives, in fact I had some timelines set, set for that in respect of uh, registration for, for companies, uh, in respect of um, uh, the various portal, the Biz Fiji portal which you see up there. Uh, we have uh, changed a number of uh, processes and just through essentially uh, a physical streamlining process we achieved a 40% reduction in turnaround times. Uh, the Biz Fiji portal will be launched on 10th of July um, and again uh, we want to have a, a one-stop reference for all processes for starting new uh, enterprise or obtaining a construction permit. Uh, we were allocated uh, I think about seven to eight million dollars to the Ministry of Industry and Trade in respect of the construction uh, permit approvals. Um, again, uh, this is very important, users will be able to access and download application forms to start a business obtain a construction permit and also provides a flow charts and timetable for the registration process including information on which processes can take place uh, simultaneously. At the moment, as you know, it's quite laborious, quite bureaucratic and indeed can be quite uh, oppressive from one perspective. Um, through the Digital Fiji app, the business registration shortly, the construction permit approval processes will be entirely online. So you don't you can only need to supply one set of documents and all the different agencies will have access to that. 
Um, you can, uh, those of you who intend to start businesses uh, uh, and companies will be able to reserve business company name or re uh, register online uh, within minutes and again the progress can be tracked. Uh, from today, um, online payment options are available for e-services such as birth registration number of registrar of company uh, services and for the next one year we actually will pay your fees that you generally would pay if you for example charge it to your credit card or your uh, visa debit card or you pay through m -Pesa. Um Now, uh, this is very important. To access all current future e-services and digital Fiji app, citizens can go to www.digitalfiji.gov.fj or download the Digital Fiji app uh, for e-profile account. Please establish your e-profile account. It's very, very important. Um, and new business companies registered from today will have the option to apply for ROC Pass ROC, which is uh, Register of Companies, which is a corporate pass account. We just had yesterday uh, 14 different organizations actually getting a particular uh, corporate pass. This included accounting firms, uh, law firms, uh, and various other, other companies, and uh, indeed we invite the banks too. Um, again, uh, this is the invitation sent send out to a number of companies, the agents and businesses to register uh, online. Um, Again, uh, what it will mean that uh, you can conduct 24-7 online company and business name searches, uh, lodge reservations uh, for uh, companies and business names, and lodge new registration application of businesses, foreign and local companies, and pay for your uh, services uh, online, which is on from today. Uh, for companies business registered after 14 June, the information will be available online, such as the company name, the directors, etc. Uh, anyone with an e-profile when searching for company re registered after 14 June can view the company name, number and the status of the company or businesses. Next one please. Uh, from 30th September, companies businesses registered after 14 June will be able to lodge online application to make basic changes to their business, whether it's a change in name, change in business or updates to their directorships. Um, we will then, of course, be asking those of you, of course, many of you already have your companies that are registered four years, five years, ten years, fifteen years ago, even two years ago. You'll be getting an uh, invitation uh, from ROC. We're doing a read registration exercise whereby existing companies and businesses that were registered prior to 14th of June uh, will be requested to re-register online and update their details. This is an ongoing process, of course. And 30th of November, companies and businesses who have undergone the re-registration process uh, will be able to lodge an application online to de-register the company or businesses. There are something like a few thousand dormant companies that are sitting there in the company's office. They have not, they've died essentially, but as for all intents and purposes, legally they're still alive. We want to kill them off nicely uh, and they need to be de-registered and you can of course do that so we have a much cleaner system. Um, we have uh, also looking at FRCS, we understand there's a lot of uh, issues with FRCS, uh, we're putting in place uh, and we'll probably be inviting somebody from your council to be part of this review committee to look at how FRCS can actually improve their processes and, and, and the uh, approaches to businesses. Uh, we think there's a number of areas in which they can be addressed and we'll be announcing that committee very soon. Um, as I mentioned about the electronic payment to employees, uh, we will be working on that and we should have in place uh, some laws regarding that by the, uh, by the end of the year. The um, construction implementation unit of the Ministry of Economy will be uh, launching a, um, a digital reform of its own. As you know that uh, most of the schools and the um, health centers, the government quarters, etc. that was damaged uh, through, in particular, after Cyclone Winston, were all outsourced. Uh, we had some interesting uh, examples where certain uh, sites, certain schools, uh, where we had QSs telling us it could be built for 1.5 million, we had people bidding at 4 or 5 million, nobody went below that. Uh, of course, there was a shortage, and that is a problem, uh, but it also goes to show that, uh, you know, we need, to, there's a lot of opportunities of good professional companies. And um, we think that with the government outsourcing work, a um, lot more uh, benefits can actually flow onto the private sector. I know some donors actually had issues with some construction companies. 
uh, where they weren't able to do things on time, uh, materials used to disappear, they did not follow the contracts. Again, I think the legal profession has a major role to play. If you go to a, any, most of the law firms in Fiji, uh, they would hardly know anything about construction law. The level of sophistication, uh, nuanced approach to construction uh, contracts is not there at all. Uh, the ability to understand things like, uh, you know, the standards, legal standards that have already been established in Australia and New Zealand is not there at all. I made a plea to the uh, law firms about two years ago for law firms in Fiji to start specializing in different areas. I mean, even we find with the road construction works that's going on in Fiji, that level of sophistication is not there within the law firms for them to be able to understand the, like I said, the sort of nuances within uh, you know, contracts that deal with construction. And uh, again, uh, you know, I like to publicly say to them that they need to actually uh, get into that space. Um, we now have, a, after Winston, with the rebuild, uh, we did work with the various organizations, including ADB, of course. So now, you know, um, MTR Shah, most of you know him, who heads the Construction Implementation Unit. We now actually have an electronic database for all the government construction related projects that captures information projects uh, for the entire life cycle. All the schools that we've built, uh, invariably 99.9% .9 of them all have a Cyclone 4 category uh, certification. And we've got a record now of what material is actually used in the building site. This government of obviously wants to ensure that we, if we do have any rebuilds, uh, we actually know exactly what's been used in that particular building. And again, it is an indication to you that you also need to lift up your game. Uh, so, of course, with this uh, particular database we've got, we also keep record of all assets, including government quarters, office space, schools, and public buildings. And, of course, we'll help streamline processes and enhance efficiency in project uh, implementation. Um, building standards, you know, that's again something that we need to talk about. We, uh, just to let you know, we've been talking to the World Bank, uh, we're talking to various companies, a couple of the insurance companies in Fiji have been uh, quite forthcoming um, in respect of assisting us. Like I said, the, the rate of uh, home, uh, insurance in Fiji is very, very low, only 10%. We want more homes, more properties insured. Uh, the standards, of course, I understand it was back in the 1990s when we had this uh, huge transformation about uh, one, uh, what you need to do to qualify for cyclone certification. What we are proposing, as we propose to insurance companies and the World Bank, etc., there needs to be certain minimal uh, you know, uh, compliance that should get, get you a particular level of uh, insurance cover. You may not get the full indemnity cover, but you could get a cover up to say about 10,000 or 15,000, even 5,000, if certain basic strappings were done and we need to agree on those standards. So again, there's opportunities there. And again, we, we, we hope that this council will come up with some innovative ideas. I mean, we're not the sole repository of all ideas. So the industry needs to come forward and also you know, come up with creative solutions as to what we can do, because the reality of the matter is is that after Cyclone Winston, we expended $125 million in the Health for Homes initiative. We spent $110 million after uh, Gita, Josie, and Kenny in the, the home care process. It is unsustainable. You cannot continue to do that. We do not have a, you know, a bottomless uh, uh, a bucket or pit where you can get money coming through. So we need to be able to build in those mitigations uh, to be able to ensure that we do get insurance, that we are able to have come up with new methodologies of construction, new methodologies, new innovative ideas so we can get some form of basic cover where we are able to then get the private sector, in this particular case, the insurance companies to participate in this space. Um, as you know, that uh, tender link I thought is worth mentioning, uh, whether our government tenders, whether ICT or non-ICT procurement, are now done through e-tender portal. Uh, it allows for prospective bidders to have access to the tender specifications and all documentation. Um, you know, I can tell you numerous stories when we did not have tender link and what the shenanigans that people used to get up to. Uh, people at different times and different clocks and different watches uh, to get the particular tenders in, but of course tender link is a very good way of creating a lot more transparency. Um, I thought I'd touch very quickly on the budget policy that has an impact on construction. Um, now, 
there is some opportunities, we believe, um, both for the private sector in the public space, in the public rental housing space and also for private sector. We're encouraging, of course, charter title ownership. And uh, there's a number of hardware company people here, I see a lot of construction companies here, you can all get into this space. So if you have multi-story development uh, on the condition that uh, if you have each story with at least 15% of the units that are costed or sold at $300,000 or less, then you get various uh, uh, subsidies uh, and duty exemptions. Um, now it's also available for uh, single story uh, housing developments. <coughs> now um, there's an income tax exemption to, on the developer profits for the entire project. Uh, there's duty exemption on capital equipment, plant and machinery, anything you bring in from overseas. And the subsidy on the capital investment is done at the following rates. If you're selling, for example, if you have fourth story, and if you have um, on the fourth story 15% of the flats are actually sold below 300,000, uh, then if there is a flat that's uh, sold for less than 100,000, you get a 7% uh, subsidy. If it's 100,000 to 200,000, it's 5%. 200,000 to 300,000, you get a 3% subsidy. We're trying to encourage what we call mixed developments. In Fiji, the problem has been this, fundamentally. When we talk about affordable housing, or what used to be called in those days low-cost housing, we put everybody in one suburb, in one corner. So, you know, you look at Nambua today, you drive down Mid Road, there are people who've been living there for decades, they have not made any what we call social progression. If they bought a flat in those days for $10,000, the value of that flat has not gone up. Even though the entire real estate around that area, the value shot through the roof. Probably gone up a thousand or two thousand percent in the last time it was built. Singapore is a classic example. If you go to uh, strata title ownership in Singapore, in particular those that have been given uh, government initiative, you'll find on the floor, I've got friends of mine who live in Singapore, you'll have a pilot, you'll have a janitor, you'll have somebody who's doing IT, you'll have a school teacher, uh, you may have somebody who's a bus driver, all living on the same floor. Different price points, of course. One could be 800,000, one could be 100,000, one could be 300,000, but the the issue there is, and the wonderful thing is, that the value of the property constantly goes up. If you assign one particular building to be all low cost, the value of that property won't go up. And the people who actually make the initial investment, they're not getting any appreciation in the dollar that they've invested. Because real estate is supposed to ensure that the dollar value of yours goes up. So if I buy a for example, an $80,000 one-bedroom flat and I'm single and I live next door to the pilot or whoever else it is on the floor. In a few years' time, when I get married or I have children, I want to buy a two-bedroom flat or I may want to go and buy a house with a bit of grass around it or a yard around it. I should be able to sell this flat that I bought for $80,000 for a higher price. Then I have what I call social mobility. So by having buildings, by having suburbs, designated as completely low-cost housing areas, you're condemning these people to, be, to remain there for the rest of their lives. It creates a lot of socioeconomic issues too. So we need to think outside the box. Unfortunately, nobody from the private sector has thought about this. We are now providing that intellectual capital for you. We want you to provide the physical capital now. Please take advantage of this. It will be quite beneficial. And the reason why we've done, just say on this slide please, the reason why we've set 15% on each floor, because of course there are people who can work around this. If you just set 15% of the entire building, they'll put all the low cost guys on the first floor and put all the top guys on the other floors. But we also recognize, we also recognize if that somebody is going to put up a building that's more than five stories, they'll get a higher price, of, oh no, as, they, as you go higher, you get a higher price. So we set up to, five stories, you can get those rebates. So uh, we have a particular proclivity, as you can see, for flats that are less than 100,000, you get 7%. So we're encouraging that. And this is our way of uh, ensuring that we get more Fijians, more of the lower socioeconomic end who can access uh, properties. And of course, government 
is also the what we call the first home uh, buyer grant. So we will actually contribute ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars towards this particular purchase of these strata apartments, which will help uh, these people. Next one, please. Now the other initiative that we have in the budget is for public-private partnership for uh, rental housing. There is a huge demand for uh, by people who want to access uh, affordable uh, rental properties. They may not necessarily be very flash, but we need a huge stockpile of this. So what we've said is that any private company uh, that negotiates with government and builds, you know, uh, multi-unit rental housing properties will be granted income tax holidays for entire duration of PPP agreement with government. So the way, just put it very simply, without going into too much detail, if you come along and say, look, I'm going to put up 500 two-bedroom or 100 uh, uh, one-bedroom apartments, and I want, my rate of return should be, I need $80 per flat a month. At the moment, the people who live there, or the range of people who are going to attract, may actually be able to afford only $40. Government will subsidize the $40 on their behalf. So you as an investor will get your $80 a month. And the idea is that public rental housing will do the management of the particular property, in other words, keep up the maintenance, etc. So we are able to inject into the market a huge stockpile of public rental housing for in particular those people who are you know, coming in from the rural areas or uh, low, end, uh, low end of the socioeconomic scale. Because government does not have to put up the capital money up front, which is always very difficult, uh, because it can be done in drips and drabs. But if you get the private sector participating, then you as an investor are able to put up this uh, housing at your cost, but you actually get a very good rate of return. And that ag again, you get various incentives uh, regarding that. We announced in last year's budget, <coughs> excuse me, um, the introduction of a 25% investment allowance uh, for any uh, commercial property in the commercial area, in the sorry, in the municipality areas, if they invested one million dollars or more on refurbishment of their buildings. Please, I urge you, if you go up to the top of uh, Kandavu House, if you come to the Ministry of Economy, I can invite you. Stand on level 10, or go to Dominion House. I think it's still called Dominion House. It's called BSP House, maybe. Go to one of, or go to Tapu City. Go to where they have the food court and look outside, look up towards Cumming Street and Mark Street. The buildings look dilapidated, they look dirty, they look filthy, and they all need a facelift and an upgrade. It does not create a really salubrious environment for your municipalities. What we've done now, we've said that we're going to reduce the uh, threshold now to $250,000. So if any um, business that owns a property, now also we've said outside municipalities also, if you're going to do an upgrade, hopefully you'll put perhaps many of the buildings aren't disabled friendly, so you don't have actually wheelchair uh, access, no wheelchair ramps. If you're able to do those refurbishments, lift up the standard of the building, you get an investment uh, uh, allowance of 25% and the threshold is $250,000. This is in our quest to ensure that we lift up the standards. It makes it a lot more attractive. People will spend more and more money. Look at the psychology of it. If you have a drabby looking building, people won't actually want to come into the building. They want to spend money. If you have a nice looking building, and naturally it's human psychology, people actually will want to spend. People automatically get enticed to spend when they go to Singapore. So you need to think outside the box again. Um, and again, as you said, the incentive has been extended to all commercial buildings apart from those in towns and cities. Next one, please. <clears throat> there are two uh, incentives we've provided for um, warehousing. Uh, we've recognized that there are many companies that actually need warehousing facilities, either for storage uh, or any other type of warehousing facilities they require for any other type of purpose. So there are two incentives for warehousing. One of them is this. If you set up a company to essentially uh, build warehouses for other people to come and rent, then uh, you get uh, uh, various types of tax holidays. 
So five-year tax holiday, for example, for capital investment of 250 to $1 million. Seven-year, you can read that for yourself, $1 million to $2 million. Thirteen-year tax holiday for more than $2 million. And of course, you get duty exemption on raw materials, plant, machinery, and equipment, including spare parts required for establishment of the actual business. That's one category, especially setting up a business for warehousing. The second one is for existing companies investing in warehouse. So you may not actually specialize in warehousing, but assuming that you are a um, supermarket chain, and uh, what you need as part of your supermarket chain, you need to actually build a warehouse so you can store your goods. Uh, so again, uh, we've said for existing companies investing in warehouses, 50% uh, allowance for investment between $1 million to $2 million, and 100% allowance for, for more than $2 million. That's again to uh, you know, uh, get people to build better stores, facilities, etc. We see some of the stores, facilities, the warehousing is done in sort of, you know, in some dodgy old street with, uh, with a lot of rats and what have you. Again, we are trying to lift up the standard uh, of the country and indeed the, the businesses themselves. Um, as you know, that Aspen uh, Medical, which is from Australia, won the tender uh, for the PPP, uh, Public-Private Partnership for Lotoka and Bar Hospital. Uh, many people have said to us, well, not many, some people have asked us, why have you done a PPP in Lotoka and Bar as opposed to, say, Suva? There are a number of reasons. Of course, uh, Lotoka has a lot more land for development because it's part of the PPP. They have to build a 250-bed hospital, um, a new wing, you know, with various teaching facilities, etc., in it. It's also very close to Dandi Airport because we see a long term prospect for uh, medical tourism, uh, not just for um, uh, Pacific Islanders, but uh, people from other countries to come to Fiji for those services. And also, the third element, of course, was uh, to ensure that we build what we call ancillary services out of that. About uh, in around about 2010 or 11, I had three Japanese companies that approached us uh, to say that they wanted to set up retirement villages in Fiji. The weather was salubrious. As you know, uh, Japan has got a vast po a percentage of the population is you know, over the age of 60. Australia has an aging population. There's numerous opportunities. The Japanese companies said they, were very, you know, they love the environment, they love the people. Our people are well known for being very good with children and also very good with elderly people that sort of nurturing, caring uh, type of approach, the psychology of it all. But then they, uh, they decided not to, because at that point in time in Fiji, we weren't able to offer full medical, you know, tertiary care facilities. So for example, at this point in time, if any one of us in this room at the moment has a heart attack, there's not a single Fijian doctor that can carry out open heart surgery. You're lucky if you've got a visiting team, or you have to go to Australia, New Zealand, or, or India, as a lot of people go to, because of the affordability. Now, when we went, uh, embarked on this PPP, the whole idea, firstly, was to ensure that Fijians are able to access various medical procedures that they currently aren't available in Fiji, and they need to be international class. And of course, uh, Aspen uh, from uh, Australia actually won the bid. Uh, we worked this through IFC. The second thing, of course, was to be able to take advantage of the fact that these procedures would be available, that other people come to Fiji for medical services. Well, a few years ago, when we had the first MRI machine um, bought uh, into the public health system, uh, we had a lot of Pacific Islanders that actually came and used the MRI machine. They paid a lot more, of course, and they got first priority. So you could see that there's a huge shortage of you know, full tertiary medical care facilities also in the rest of the Pacific Island countries. The ancillary service to this is that once you have full tertiary care facilities available in Fiji, then there's a lot of opportunities for retirement villages, uh, for aged care. Uh, we have literally a few thousand women, predominantly from Fiji, working in San Francisco providing aged care. A lot of people know about that. A lot of people, they earn a lot of good money. So we've said that if anybody invests in the retirement village space or aged care facilities, uh, we'll give them various tax holidays for that. Uh, we also want FNU to provide and develop courses for aged care uh, uh, you know, certification, so our people can actually get proper certification at FNU, and then you know, investors will be more readily willing to come to Fiji uh, to invest in that space, so we've given various uh, 
tax holidays and also duty exemptions on plant machinery, etc. Um, most of you are in businesses, so all the FNPF uh, money that you contribute, your 10%, it's now 100% uh, deduction, tax deduction. Used to be 50%. This is to, of course, help you. So please make sure you pay everybody's FNPF. You can claim 100% of that. Um, and again, uh, we have uh, losses being carried forward. As we've said that now you can carry forward your losses for the next eight years as opposed to four years and the losses being um, attributable from the 1st of Jan of this year onwards. We've reduced the duty on heavy uh, machinery. Um, again, you know, things like um, you know, forklifts, cranes, bulldozers, excavators have been reduced. Uh, heavy machinery will now attract only a 5% fiscal duty, 0% uh, uh, import uh, excise. Previously, it used to be 5% fiscal, 5% import. In other words, 10%, we'll pay now 5%. Second hand heavy machinery, again, will attract only 5% in uh, fiscal and 5% import. Uh, previous rates used to be 15 fiscal and 0% excess, so now there was a 10% reduction. Again, this is to spur on that uh, you know, investment uh, in heavy machinery. Um, new trucks, again, uh, will attract only 5% fiscal and 0% import excise. Uh, previously used to be 15% plus 5%. Uh, so you know, this is a significant reduction in trucks. Of course, we want everybody to adhere to the load standards that have been set by LTA. Um, used trucks, again, uh, the import duty has been reduced. Uh, the age restriction has been removed as long as it's Euro 4. So you can pick up Euro 4 trucks in Japan that's about 10 years old, uh, but you can still bring it in. The age restriction is not there as long as it's Euro 4. Of course, if it's 10 years old, not Euro 4, then you can't bring it in. Um, so just, just go back into that. So, um, you know, we've also got uh, specialized vehicles that have also been incorporated into this, uh, into, into this uh, space too. Um, this is a matter of interest. You know, the, uh, from this year, from 1st of Jan, we've got Euro 5 fuel coming into Fiji. This was implemented last year. But surprisingly, brand new cars that come into Fiji are Euro 2. So we've said that's going to stop now. We've had a number of new car dealers saying, you know, we can't do that. We said, we have to do that. So they should have been prepared for this. So any new vehicle that comes into Fiji also has to be Euro 4. And second-hand vehicles, of course, can be Euro 4, but can have uh, no age restriction on that. Next one, please. Uh, steel pipes, the duty reduction has been re uh, reduced. Fiscal duty on steel pipes, galvanized pipes, stain uh, stainless and steel pipes, rectangular tubing not manufactured in Fiji has been reduced to 5% from 32%. It uh, used to be 32%, is now 5%. And duty on wind ventilators has also been reduced from 15% to uh, 0% actually. Um, those of you who do construction work for the hotels, um, for new hotels under the slip in incentive, uh, the current duty exemptions uh, have been extended to uh, including building materials, furnishings and fittings, equipment, room amenities, kitchen and dining room essentials, etc. Um, and hotels under the uh, existing hotels, uh, sorry that two years uh, needs to be uh, also for the new uh, slip. Uh, new and existing. So, in other words, if I'm a existing hotel and I want to do renovations, I need to do the next two years. If I do the next two years, I'll get those uh, incentives that's been uh, put out there. So, for those of you in the construction industry, if I were you, I'd, I'd be very proactive and approach hotels because they'll want to take advantage of this two-year window that's been given to them to do in renovations. If they do those renovations in the next two years, then they'll get all those uh, various uh, exemptions and duty reductions. Because the whole idea, again, for us is to provide that, you know, that, uh, I suppose, that bolt of injection into the economy through the construction sector. So we've said in the next two years they need to do that. Uh, next, I think that's the end of it. Am I? Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that uh, uh, we, um, we have consolidated our fiscal position uh, through the budget. Uh, we are, of course, trying to lift up the standards overall in Fiji through the various digital projects, um, ease of doing business focus, uh, and you'll see enormous changes, in particular in the next 18 months, uh, that should make uh, you know, your business a lot more 
uh, easier to um, uh, negotiate, to be able to get, go to the various government agencies. Um, we also, as you know, uh, provided a number of initiatives in, in respect of construction, and we hope you take advantage of that. But the last point I'd like to make, please, it is critically important for all of you to understand that we need to lift up the standards in Fiji. We need to think outside the box. Please don't continue to do the same thing that you've been doing for the past 10, 15 years. Please think outside the box. We need to be able to grow the economy, and the way to grow the economy is to ensure that we have new standards, new way of thinking, new architectural plans, new uh, ideas, and please talk to us about that, because you know, collaboratively, we can do quite a lot. We also have to ensure that, last but not least point is, of course, to ensure that we have a good environmental standards being adhered to, because that is really our, our, our golden egg. If we let go of the uh, environmental standards, then we will actually killing the goose that lays the golden egg, frankly. Uh, people come to Fiji because of the fact that we have certain environmental standards. We are getting rid, rid of uh, reusable uh, plastic bags, or what we sorry, single-use plastic bags, I should say, from the 1st of Jan. We've also made announcements that uh, from uh, within 18 months we're getting rid of things like styroforms. It was interesting, I saw a, uh, an article yesterday of uh, somebody in Philippines who's actually making uh, uh, you know, chairs and tables out of plastic, uh, recycled plastic for school children. We have, as announced in the budget, which was not up there, we've designated the land around the Namboro landfill as waste management area. So those of you want to be in that space, you can do that. I've seen in certain countries now we're using uh, uh, tires for road construction. It gives that apparently a level of flexibility and durability. So please constantly think outside the box. We are trying to do that. We need you to be able to do that. You're obviously more at the cutting edge of it. And um, we can collaboratively, collaboratively actually do quite a lot together. Thank you very much. Naka.